All right, guys, we're going to read tonight in Luke 14. I'm going to start reading in verse number 25 and go through the end of the chapter. The Bible says this, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come up after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. For what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Now this is verse number 32. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Notice what he says in verse 34. Sometimes we disconnect this from the rest of the passage, but it goes together. It says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. All right. This is, this is a good passage for us to review tonight and to talk about. Um, maybe you've heard this passage read before, but we're going to kind of dig into it and see what it really means. I want to ask you a question first. How would you describe to someone outside of church what the Christian life is like or what it is about? Now, I'm, not, I'm not talking about people that normally go to church. I'm talking about someone that walks up to you on the job site and, say, and says, what is the Christian life about? What is it like? What would you say? All right. I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah, so service, glorifying the Lord. Anybody? Life changing. Okay, yeah. So you think anybody would ever describe the Christian life, maybe with somebody they work with or a lost family member, say, hey, you know, the Christian life is about self-denial. It's not about you any longer. Would you explain that the Christian life is about being God-centered rather than being man-centered? Would you explain it's not about self-love or self-fulfillment? Would you explain that it involves being willing to submit to the Lord in every single area of your life? The reason why I ask this question is most of the time when, when someone asks, hey, what's it like being a Christian? Or, oh, it's the greatest thing ever. It's just, I'm just so blessed. More than likely, that's our response. When, when we talk about Christianity, we blow this huge balloon up and say, well, it's great. There's, really, there's nothing wrong. My life's been great ever since I turned to the Lord. It's just been smooth sailing. Most people don't paint an accurate picture of the Christian life. Uh, they make it sound much different than reality. There's a fellow that wrote a book, and the title of the book is called Hard to Believe. The guy's name is John MacArthur, and he wrote it years ago, but uh, he described how many times the gospel has been replaced with this sort of consumer mentality, this consumer mindset. And how the gospel, the true gospel of self-abandonment, has been replaced with a watered-down message. And I, I wish I could just read the whole book to you, but I can't. I want to read to you just a small portion of John MacArthur's book. It's called Hard to Believe. And listen to what he says about how we sell Christianity today. He says, The first role of successful merchandising is to give consumers what they want. If they want bigger burgers, make them make their burgers bigger. 
Designer bottled water and six fruit flavors? Well, done. Mini vans with 10 cup holders? Give them 20. You've got to keep the customer satisfied. You've got to modify your product and your message to meet the needs if you want to build a market and get ahead of the competition. That's that consumer mentality. Always bigger and better and flashier. And this is what he says. Today, this same consumer mindset has invaded Christianity. The church service is too long, you say? Well, we'll shorten it. In fact, one pastor makes the claim, one megachurch pastor makes the claim his service will never be, his message will never be longer than seven minutes long. Seven minutes. Too formal? Wear your sweatshirt. Too boring? Wait till you hear our band. And if the message is too controversial or too judgmental or too exclusive, scary, unbelievable, hard to understand or too much anything else for your taste, churches everywhere are eager to adjust the message to make you more comfortable. This new version of Christianity makes you a partner on the team, a design consultant on church life, and does away with the old-fashioned authority, accountability, and moral absolutes. Now listen to this. One suburban church sent out a mailer recently promising an informal, relaxed, casual atmosphere, great music from our band, and that those who will come, believe it or not, will actually have fun. That's all great for a coffee shop, but anyone who claims to be calling people to the gospel of Christ with those as their priorities is calling them to a lie. It's Christianity for consumers. I like what he calls this, Christianity light. The redirection, watering down, and misinterpretation of the biblical gospel in order to attempt to make it more palatable and popular. It tastes great going down, but it settles light. It seems to salve your feelings and scratch your itch. It's custom tailored to your preferences. But that lightness will never fill you up with the true saving gospel of Jesus Christ, because it's designed by man and not by God. It is hollow and worthless. In fact, it's worse than worthless because people who hear the message of Christianity light think they're hearing the gospel. They think that they're being rescued from eternal judgment when in fact they're being tragically misled. Now listen to this. This is what he says about the true gospel. The true gospel is a call to self-denial. It's not a call to self-fulfillment. And that puts it in opposition to contemporary evangelical gospel where ministers view Jesus as a genie. You rub the lamp and He jumps out. You say whatever you want. You give Him your list and He delivers. That sounds a lot like what's being preached from pulpits today, right? Sounds a lot like churches. It's all about you rather than all about Him. So let me fill fill in your blank before we dig into verse 25. Unlike Christianity light, the true gospel doesn't offer heaven on earth. The true gospel offers heaven in heaven. You see the difference? You see, in our passage tonight, Jesus calls people to this extreme standard. You know what Jesus calls people to do? He's not calling them to have a makeover in their life. He's calling them to have a takeover in their life. There's a difference. So what does Jesus in this passage challenge sinners to do? He calls them to submit. He calls them to submission because He's the divine dictator. He's the ruler. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the controller. Not man. And what I hope you guys see in these next few verses is that Jesus never called someone to pray this simple, short prayer, and then they were saved. Do you see that? He never uh, manipulated the crowd and told them to raise up their hand for this sort of emotional decision. Never happened anywhere in Scripture. He never taught them that the way to heaven was easy. In fact, I'll give you two verses you can write on your paper that show just the opposite, that the way to heaven is not easy. In Matthew chapter 7, verse number 14, Jesus says the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few that find it. 
So it's not, it's not easy. It's like a rugged trail. You're having to honest, honestly think and assess what is the best route, what is the way to the destination. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So again, for those that are truly in Christ, headed towards heaven, it involves extreme commitment, not shallow, shallow, superficial faith. What happens to those who will not commit fully in submission to Christ's Lordship? Does anybody know? What would happen to these people that Jesus is speaking to in this passage if they said, no, I just really don't want to commit? I don't feel like taking this extreme call to discipleship. What happens to them? It's the same thing that happens to people today who will not commit fully to Christ. They will die and they'll go to hell. That's the reality of the calling. What if you do commit to this extreme call to discipleship? What's the end reward? Right. With Christ. So, heaven awaits those who give up everything. Who repent and confess Christ. So, again, this, this passage, as we're going through it, starting in verse number 25, we're going to see three marks of a genuine disciple of Christ. The first is this. One of the true tests if you're a real born-again believer is a rejection of past priorities. So all the things that you were committed to in the past, the things that were important, that were higher up in the totem pole, there's a rejection of that. All right, so... Understand from the context, when we get to verse 25, the cross is really only a few months away. And notice what's going on. There's still crowds that are following Jesus. Verse 25 says, Now crowd, now great crowds accompanied Him, and He turned and He said to them. Notice what He's going to call them to. Number one, on your paper. A true disciple must prefer God over his family. A true disciple must prefer God over his family. Now, where do we see that? Look at verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You see, what happens many times when salvation takes place in a man or a woman's life, it creates a disturbance, a disruption we could even say an agitation within his existing family life. It turns things upside down in a family when somebody is converted. You see, this new believer then tries to, he attempts or she attempts to coexist with their family. Like we can just all kind of live together. But something happens. Those family members who reject the gospel then blacklist the one who is trying to follow Christ. And they try to make it harder on the one that's trying to do the right things. Again, the reason why I'm pointing this out is, well, number one, it's the next verses in our lineup. But I also want people to understand that true discipleship, becoming a true follower of Christ, is hard. In fact, Jesus promised in the Gospels that there would be disruptions in family. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 34. This is Jesus. And this is what He says about families being divided. He says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of their own household. So, again, we can't be surprised when there's agitation in the family. I wrote a question on your paper. I want to read it right quick. Is the Lord's teaching 
Is the Lord teaching that it is necessary to hate one's family? Is that inconsistent with the Bible's other commands? So right here, verse number 26, it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father. Wait a second. Is he calling for us to hate? What, what does this mean here in the original language? And what do, how do we balance verse number 26 with other scriptural mandates? You know, in Scripture it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25, that husbands are to love their wives. Here, in verse 26, it says, if he doesn't hate his own wife. Now wait, is there inconsistencies in Scripture? You have Ephesians 5, love your wife. And Luke chapter 14, verse number 26 says, you don't hate your wife. Titus chapter 2, verse number 4 says, wives are to love their husbands. Titus 2 and Ephesians 6, parents are supposed to love their children. What Are there inconsistencies here? No, there's not. In fact, we have to keep in mind, Scripture complements Scripture. Nothing contradicts in Scripture. What we have to understand is the way this was written, going back to the original language. This is a Semitic way of saying you prefer one over the other. The original language plays it so much more clear than our English translations. Let me give you some examples. So you can even go back in the Old Testament. There's a passage of Scripture in Malachi chapter number 1, verse number 2, that says, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. You guys remember that? So did the Lord actually hate Esau? Was there this genuine dislike for Esau? No. Rather, God preferred Jacob in and that He gave him the promise rather than Esau. Let me give you another example. In Genesis 29, verse number 31, the Bible says that Leah was unloved, but... Uh, you guys remember this with Jacob? He had two wives, Rachel and Leah. Now, do, does it really mean Jacob hated Leah? Well, if you go back that to Genesis 29, it says that she was unloved, but in the he, original Hebrew, it literally means hated. He preferred one of his wives over the other. That's the point. So what's the point here? To become a disciple of Christ, does that mean you have to hate your wife? It means you have to hate your children and your mom and dad? To hate, in this biblical text, means to prefer God over your wife and over your children and over your parents. That means the default in every situation is God. His will, His word, and His preferences. It means you love God more, and it means you love them less. When you get in a conflict with your wife, or your husband, or your dad, or your mom, in the midst of that conflict, what this means, as a disciple of Christ, it means that you're always going to defer in that conflict to what God's word says, and what He wants rather than what your parents want. Listen to this. Matthew 10, verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You have to understand, in the first century, whenever you made a public profession of faith in Christ, it wasn't like it is today. So it's very possible that someone could come into one of our local Baptist churches, make a public profession of faith, say, hey, I want to join the church as well. They vote on them, and then that very next day run off and nobody ever sees them again. No, no skin lost, right? But that wasn't the way it was during the first century. In fact, when somebody made a public profession of faith, there was immediate consequences in their life. More than likely, they lost their job. Uh, they were kicked out. Um, What's the right word? Disowned from their family. So this is, this is what Christ is wanting people to understand. You've got to count the cost. 
There was no casual Christianity during Jesus' time. All right, let's keep moving. On your paper, second, a person who would come to Jesus must hate even his own life. L-I-F-E, not wife, life. You see, when a man is converted, that means the end of himself. That means he's under new management, under new authority. Look at verse number 26. It says, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What we have to understand is that when we commit to following Christ, everything we are gaining, the great pearl, the great treasure as Jesus described it, what we are gaining is eternally superior to what we're leaving behind. So you, again, count the cost. If I follow Christ, it may mean that I'm not healthy and wealthy and well-known in this life, but in the eternal, it's going to be different. We're heirs with Christ. We inherit an inheritance from the Son. Or you could say, well, you know, I really would rather be, I'd rather have my Sundays for myself. I still want to be able to continue to bass fish or ride motorcycles or go on all my vacations. You know, it's, you see, it, it's a matter of counting the cost. True disciples must be ready for complete abandonment, understanding it's no longer about us. What, I, what we want, our dreams, but it's worth so much more. All right, third, a person who would be Christ's disciple must give up all his own possessions. Now let's talk about this. Look at verse number 33. The Bible says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. If you're reading out the ESV tonight, it uses the word renounce. Uh, the original word is uh, apostaso, which it means this. To renounce means to give up. It means to take leave of or to say goodbye to. You see, let me tell you a story real right quick. In Luke chapter 18, which we're not there yet, there's a rich young man, the rich young ruler, who come up to Christ and says, I've done this and this and this. What do I got to do in order to go to heaven? And Jesus looks at him square in the eye and says, Hey, you need to go take all you have, sell it, and give it to the poor. You know what the guy did? I mean, he'd done a lot of good things. The Bible says he went away sad. Why? Because he loved what he had more than he loved the Lord. He wasn't willing to give it up. Now, I'm going to say this before we go on, because there have been people over the years in church history that have misrepresented verse number 33, using that to push a socialist agenda. That's not what, it, that's not what that verse means. This verse doesn't mean that every person that's a member of this church needs to sell every single thing that they have and live in poverty, and all we eat is beans, and we don't even have any fat meat to put in it. That's not what this means. That's not what verse 33 means. Here's the point. Here's your fill in the blank. His point is that those who would be his disciples must recognize that they are stewards of everything. The Lord stewards us, allows us to manage everything, yet we own nothing. None of it's ours. Your kids, your family, your house, your vehicle, your health, all of those things are simply borrowed for a short time. A true disciple would be willing to give it up, to give up everything if Christ called them to do it because obedience to Him would be their highest joy. All right. Let's review for a second, because I know it's seven, whatever, o'clock. Some of you guys have been up really early, and you're just trying to keep your eyes open. What have we learned so far about true discipleship? 
what Jesus is trying to teach us tonight through this passage is He doesn't want people just to rush into following Him. He wants them to think about what's involved, count the cost. You know what this would do during the first century? It would cause people not to make half-hearted decisions. It would also help people to understand that they need to have an all-in attitude. Like, hey, I'm all in. Absolutely, let's do this. All right, let's move on. Point number two. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Number two, understanding the present sacrifice. What Jesus does now is He's going to give us some illustrations on what it means to count the cost. And He, he gives us two practical life situations of why it's important to count the cost. The first one is this. Look at verse number 28. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? So here's a guy, he's going to build a tower. What do you think a tower would have been used for during the first century? That's what I initially thought. Yeah, so a watchtower against the enemies? Yeah. Anybody else? Also, did a little research. Think of like a silo, a tower, maybe to store goods in. So there's two possible options. Either way, whether it's a watchtower or something like a, a granary of some sort, it would have been something visible where anyone in the community could see this guy begin to build. Kind of like and just something recent in our community, the solar panels. You've drove this way and that way. There's a lot of dirt being stirred up. It's very visible. Everybody knows what's going on. You see, during this time in the ancient Near East, it would be very easy to bring shame upon your name or your family's name if you started a project but didn't have the money to finish it. And so, look at verse number 29. It says, Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man begins to build and was not able to finish. So let's say this guy starts building this big tower and then he gets like halfway through and he's like, man, my resources are thin. I can't finish the thing. People would have laughed at him. In the same way, we probably laugh at solar panel people. Like, dude, you stirred up all this ground. Now you're, you're out of here. The community would have laughed. The point of this, these verses is the guy should have sat down and did some figuring before he started his project. Now, look at the second illustration he gives. Verse 31. It says, Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet with him who comes out with him with 20,000? So again, here's an attacking king who is approaching another king and his army. So before the combat takes place, it would be very wise for the king to sit down and come up with a plan, right? You're about to wage war with somebody else. What should he do? So he began to talk to his other men about logistics. Hey, should we flank this way? Should we flank this way? How, what's the tactical advantage? What sort of terrain are we on? Is there anywhere that we can use as, uh, as a shield, a fortress? What, what is our weaponry like compared to the incoming army? Do we have any strategic or tactical advantages? Do they have numerical uh, superiority? Do they have more people or do we? You see what I'm saying? Like You're going into battle, you need to have all your ducks in a row. To proceed into battle without counting the cost would be foolish. If you count all the cost as a king, fixing to go into battle, and there's no possible way you can win, then notice verse number 32. This would be the only smart option. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. <laughs> you realize that you're the weaker army? You send out, try to make peace before you get slaughtered. Why does Jesus share the story about the man building the tower and next the story about the king? Why does he do that? What's the point of both of those stories? Well, 
What he's trying to teach them, and he's trying to teach us as well, is the wisdom in carefully counting the cost. The commitment involved in following Jesus. You don't just up and say, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus, and then just dive in, and you get way over your head. What Jesus wanted people to do is to sit down and think through what is involved in this commitment. Jesus didn't want surface level commitment. Uh, commitment driven by emotion, uh, self, self-seeking commitment, like, hey, I'm just going to join in so that I can get something out of it. He didn't want momentary followers. He wanted people that contained real faith that persevered all the way to the end. As I read these two illustrations, these are two, here's a few questions that come to my mind. These aren't on your paper. I wonder in our community, or even in our church, like how many half-built towers are scattered all throughout our community? Have you ever thought about that? People that come in, they hear a message, and maybe they're emotionally moved because of something that's going on in their life, and then they never really count the cost. And it's just, it's just a half-built tower. They weren't able to finish. Here's another question that I really am troubled by. I wonder how many pastors stand behind a pulpit Sunday after Sunday after Sunday encouraging commitment to Christ without leading and guiding people to first pause and reflect the cost of doing so. Have you ever thought about that? Hey, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. And people are looking and they're hungry and they're thirsty. But then they get into it, and what they've been served is just this sort of sugary substance, no meat, and they participate in it, but then they go away and they're just as hungry as they they came in. Another question, I wonder how many people have covered themselves with the veneer of Christianity, yet they're just kind of some what involved only when it's convenient. So yeah, I'm a Christian. On the outside, looks pretty good. And they're just kind of casually involved in the local church. There's no, there's no dying to self. Um, really, their Christianity is just self-serving. It's what they can get out of it. And so the encouragement in this passage and the encouragement for whoever's listening, is for those that are temporary, those that contain maybe even false faith, would assess their motives. Are we really ready to keep the commitments to Christ that He demands? If He tells you, hey, you need to get rid of this and this and this material possession, not because He needs the money, but because he wants the idol removed out of your life, would you be willing to do it? <laughs> That's a hard question, right? What if he told you to distance yourself from a family member because they're distracting you in your pursuit of holiness? Would you do it? So what we've seen so far in this radical call towards discipleship is rejecting past priorities. We've learned about understanding present sacrifice, but also becoming a disciple involves future allegiance as well. It's not like we just do it for a certain time. So I like these two verses. I want to dig into it for a second. Look at verse 34 and 35. It says, salt is good, but if salt has... I like salt, by the way. Like, I like to eat salt. I put salt on everything. So whenever I read salt is good, that's almost like a verification in my mind. Like, keep eating salt. It says, salt is good. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soul or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. All right. A lot of people don't realize it. These two verses are connected to the last. Let me explain why. You see, salt 
was used before Pollux Appliance come onto the scene. What I mean by that is before we had refrigeration, people preserved using salt. Now, in the Old Testament, we read a lot about salt. Salt was used in the sacrifices. Salt was used in the Old Testament covenants. What you have to understand about salt is that it usually doesn't spool. It usually doesn't go bad. That's why it's used as a, a preservative. Salt usually is pretty good. So why does he say here, if the salt has lost its taste? Well, again, we live in America. Most of us have never went out of the country, so we don't understand the context that's going on here. You see, when salt was harvested in the ancient Near East, you have to understand that a lot of it come from the vicinity of the Dead Sea. Do you know why it's called the Dead Sea? Why? Because of salt. You're right. Well, when salt was harvested from the Dead Sea, much of it was contaminated with what we call gypsum. Gypsum would contaminate the salt, and it would lose its effectiveness, and it would become tasteless. It was useless. So look at verse 35. It is, it is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. Salt that's lost its saltiness, salt that's been contaminated, it can't be used as a fertilizer. What happens when you dump a lot of salt out upon the grass? Well, we actually did that. Uh, we had to replace our water softener, went out and <laughs> I, didn't think, I didn't count the cost, right? So I poured it out at the edge of the yard. There's still no grass there um, next to our pig pen. It's just, it's just mud. It can't be thrown onto the manure pile because salt doesn't decompose the way you might think. So what could it be used for? What can worthless salt be used for? It says right here, it's of no use either to the soil or the manure pile. It's thrown away. It could only be used around the fields to keep the weeds off in the footpath. That's really... It can only be trampled underfoot. Now, why would Jesus use this illustration here talking about discipleship? What Jesus is again saying, He doesn't want temporary disciples. He wants people that have skin in the game that are going to continue. Not that are just salty for a season, help preserve, and then fall away. That's not what He wants. He wants those who will commit lifelong loyalty to Him it's only those disciples that can be used by Him for the good in this world. Now, again, what we have to understand, and many times our heart moves to a place where we want to be a disciple of Christ. We want to follow Him. We want to live under His Lordship. But there's times in which we fail. There's times that we mess up. Sometimes we do fail due to family pressure. Sometimes we fail because of selfishness. Or, or maybe in our lives, we know that we're to be following Christ. We know we're supposed to live under His submission. But then we give in to the pull of materialism. We want this and we want that. And sometimes it's tempting to, to think, hey, well, am I really going to make it to the end? Am I really a disciple of the Lord? If you ask that question, that's probably a pretty good indicator that you are a real disciple. You want to honor the Lord. Uh, you have to understand that if you are truly one of God's children, even your failures can't change positionally where you stand before a holy God. But, let me fill in your next blank before I get off track. Like contaminated salt, those contaminated by worldliness will be thrown out into eternal judgment. Contaminated salt is thrown out. Those that are contaminated with the world will also be thrown out. We're almost done, but I want you to see what Jesus, how Jesus closes. He says this, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
So this is a challenge. He's challenging a crowd. Again, the cross is just a few months away. He's challenging them to hear, to receive, and to take hold of the message. So what do we, how, do we, how do we end our time tonight? I want you to understand that I, under, I know many of you in this room are here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. There's a lot of people, if you look around, who are not here on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. There's a lot of people that we know who have come to church and then for a season just kind of fell, fallen away. Not even the FBI can find them. We don't know where they went. Why is this? The reason why is many people make a superficial response to the gospel and they don't count the cost. So when you witness to your family member or to your children or to whomever it is, don't. There is urgency, and I understand that, but don't ramrod someone through the religious system. Does that make sense? We don't want to produce disciples that are about an inch deep and a mile wide. We want disciples that are rooted so that when the storms come, they're not blown over. We want them to have deep roots that are founded in the Word and the will of God. Because what are they going to do when the storms of life come? They're just going to simply excuse themselves. Well, it's just too hard. My roots can't go deep. No, Help them to understand, more than likely, you're going to have a lot of family trouble if you're really doing what the Bible says. It's not going to be easy. You may come across financial trouble. There's going to be people who hate your guts simply because you are a pleasing aroma of Christ. They like the smell of death. Here's my questions. What is our motivation to turn to Christ, to avoid excuses, to pursue Christ and His kingdom at all costs? What's our motivation in order to do what we've learned tonight? Yeah, I think Tristan is exactly right. So the first, pro the first reason is the Lord. And that should be enough. And that we have opportunity to spend the rest of eternity building intimacy with the Holy God. So yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So I'm going to end with how we begin. The title of our message was Disciple or Deceived. My question is, are you a true disciple? Have you counted the cost or are you just simply deceived? You're going through the religious motions. You may have walked an aisle, said a prayer at vacation Bible school, but you're not willing to give up material possessions. You're not willing to give up past priorities. You're okay indulging in the sins. You've added Christianity to your life like an accessory. I had a quote I wanted to read, but I'm not going to. I'll save it for another day.